This is the Your Career Story Podcast, and you're listening to episode 71, the five steps anyone with great experience can use to land their dream job. Welcome to Your Career Story Podcast, a show that's designed for rock star professionals looking for that extra booster shot of confidence in their careers. Whether you're trying to get clarity on a job transition, want some work-life balance inspiration, or need a strategy to snag that promotion or raise, this podcast is for you. I'm your host, Jenna Viviano, ex-Wall Streeter turned startup junkie who now coaches hundreds of clients, empowering them to take back control of the job search and land their dream job. So sit back, grab a glass of wine, and prepare yourself for your weekly boost of career confidence. friends. Welcome back to another episode of the Your Career Story podcast. I am doing a little intro to give you some context around this conversation today. I actually recorded this with my friend Adenola beginning of this year in 2020. And then we kind of took a different route with the podcast. And so we never released this. And in the, in the anticipation of me no longer doing one-on-one coaching, which if you follow me on LinkedIn, you probably have seen that post that I'm no longer doing any one-on-one coaching. All of our business is going to be moving more towards memberships and courses that we're going to be offering that some of you have already enrolled in, which I I'm, I'm love seeing the progress that people are already making in that course. So I wanted to share with you some other career coaches. And I thought this conversation that we had had way Way back when with Adnola and I, um, we could actually bring that and so that you guys could actually meet a coach that I would really, really recommend hiring. I love her methodology. She walks through in this conversation that we've had about her steps that she takes clients through to help them land their dream job and negotiate thousands more. Um, we have a very similar methodology. So if you're really looking for a one-on-one coach, I highly, highly recommend um, reaching out to Adenola and learning more about her process, learning more about what she has to offer in her program and checking her out. She's great. Um, you might also remember her actually from a couple of conversations back where we did a conversation around race in the workplace and she was my guest on there. And we just had a really great candid conversation. So one, make sure you go back and listen to that Two, listen to the rest of this conversation. If you like what you hear, if you're excited about potentially making a career change and you're looking for that one-on-one attention or more customized attention, I would definitely check out Adnola and her program. So without further ado, here's my conversation with her. Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of the Your Career Story. I am super excited for my very special guest that I got the wonderful privilege of connecting with over Instagram, which if you follow me on Instagram, you know that I'm no longer spending time there. So if you want to see what I'm up to, you need to head over to LinkedIn. But I got the opportunity to connect with her on LinkedIn, I'm sorry, on an Instagram, and we just really hit it off and have been each other's cheerleaders throughout the process of building our own businesses, our own career coaching businesses. So I'm going to be introducing my friend, Adanala. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yes. So excited to be here for the conversation (laughs) we're going to get to have. (laughs) Yes. It's going to be super fun. So when I talk about career coaching, I always tell people like, if I'm not your cup of tea, find another career coach to help you invest back in your career and strategically move you forward in your career and where you want to go. I am not the right person for every single person, but she may be. So I, I'm a huge fan of women supporting women and um, business owners supporting other business owners. And so for the people that it doesn't make sense for you to work with me, you may want to work with her. So why don't you share a little bit about your story? How did you get into career coaching? Yes. So I got into career coaching actually. So I'll start from the beginning in a sense of I'm Nigerian American. And I always say when you're Nigerian, you're allowed to only be five things, which is a doctor, a nurse, a lawyer, (laughs) an engineer, or a failure. (laughs) That is funny. So I kind of fell in that fifth category (laughs) um, because I wanted to go into PR, which, you know, to this day, my family and friends have like aunts and uncles have no idea what PR even stands for. So I was like, in a sense of when I was about to graduate, I was really determined to like prove to everyone, like, I'm not going to be the failure that they thought I was going to be because I wasn't in the other categories of occupations. And so I started like this job hunt six months before graduating because I was like, I got to make this work. Like I got to get this job. And I ended up getting a job three days after graduating. And it was my dream job at a global PR firm. And I was like living the dream be- like in the beginning. Like mm-hmm. I was working in the global chairman's office. I had made some different moves to different offices, moved to a new city with the company. And so it was like living the dream until it wasn't. 
Mm -hmm. And I I feel like a lot of people can relate to that (laughs) sentiment that's listening. Right, Mm -hmm. right. And, you know, I found myself in a place where like, well, this is what I wanted. So now what do I want? And what do I do next? And when I, it took me, I would say four months in that role to really kind of be like, okay, I'm going to get serious about leaving because it was a global PR firm. It was decent. It was like great pay, all of these things. And so when I finally decided that it was time for me to leave, I knew the strategies I needed to be able to take that next step in my career because I had learned them because I was so serious in college of getting mm-hmm. a new job. Mm-hmm. And so I was able to make a new, get a new role within seven weeks of deciding that it was time for me to make a change in my career mm-hmm. or actually getting serious about it. And I realized that there are so many people like colleagues who hated the job as well and friends I knew who worked at really good companies, but didn't really feel fulfilled in them. They felt the same way I did, but they didn't know how to make the change. Mm-hmm. And so I, they started quickly reaching out to me to say like, hey, how did you do it? Can you help me with this? And I remember I had a, a friend text me like, what did I put in this subject line? I'm going to send this <laughs> like, you know all the professional help. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you know what? I need to turn this into like a solution, like a real solution for people so that they can actually get the support they need um, because they're already asking me for very specific questions. <laughs> Did so you feel that- like you've always had an entrepreneurial itch? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. So I think that's very important to say too, because I feel like there's a, there is this world that we live in now that's very encouraging of an entrepreneurialism, if you will, or like leaving your job and, mm-hmm. and going and doing your own thing. While it may be right for me and you, we probably always had the entrepreneurial right. itch. It is right. not right for everybody. So right. if you listen to this and you're like, yes, maybe the solution is for me to leave my job and start my own thing. Like that's right. may not be the thing for you. No. It's really no. important to remember that the entrepreneurial, if you have the entrepreneurial itch, it's probably never going to go away until you scratch it. And then right. also if you really have never really had that and you're just wanting to escape, you also should probably not start your own business. Would you agree with me? Oh, I really want to stress that. I feel like social media makes entrepreneurship seem so glamorous. And I always say like, it's only one career path. It's not mm-hmm. the career path. Yes. And there's so many actual easier ways to get more fulfillment because there is a long road of entre- entrepreneurship. And totally. for me, mm-hmm. I was going to say that my mom was an entrepreneur. So that kind of instilled that in me for a, a, from the beginning of birth. <laughs> yeah, But it's not for everyone. And it's not, it's not always something that you, I think a lot of times people say, well, just get a side hustle. And it's like, that isn't always easy. So yeah, mm-hmm. I totally agree. Yeah. I think that there is what people ha- don't realize is that entrepreneurs are really great marketers. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so they're marketing to you, telling you to quit your job because they want you to buy their program. Like that's what's happening. Right. Right. <laughs> they're naturally going to make it look amazing all the time. And it is amazing for me and my lifestyle and what I want mm-hmm. in my life. It is not necessarily the same across the board. When right. all my clients come in, I ask them, what do you want out of your life? And then we can decide, okay, what does that mean for your career now? Right. Right, And so you have to really be honest with yourself about what makes the most sense. So I totally relate to you on that. So you decided, okay, it's time for me maybe to make some sort of business out of this because everybody keeps on quote unquote picking my brain, even though I hate (laughs) right. Everyone's picking my brain. What can what what can I do to make this into a business? So what did you do next? Yeah. So after that, it's so it's funny. Um I'm really as you can see, I started as I said earlier, I started looking for a job six months at six months before graduation. So I've always been the type to like, I'm very type A and I decided to get a coach actually. So I was like, I didn't want to do like the trial and error of like having a business and failing. And, you know, people say like, you know, work 10 years and then you're going to make it it work. And I was just like, I don't want to do that. So So I actually just got a coach. I got a business coach and invested in myself and learned the ropes of like what it takes to really have a successful business. Um, I knew that I didn't want because I was in between like going back to get my MBA or, you know, do I just invest in getting a coach? And so I decided to get a coach and it really was what helped my business take off. And since then I've been being able to help people and dozens of industries being, being able to land that senior role or that mid-level role that they want in their career next. So it's been a journey and a wild ride, but very fun. <laughs> I can so relate to that. I'd love to ask you a question about you deciding to go into coaching. So I think a lot of people who that's not an automatic thing, like what were the things that you were fearful of when you were investing in coaching and how did you overcome that fear of that investment? So Hindsight is 2020, right? So mm-hmm. looking back, it's like, I wish I would have known too that 
every investment isn't going to be a good investment. And Mm -hmm. when I first started, I was so like, again, type A, like I, if I can avoid mistakes, let me, I mean, you're always going to make mistakes, but if I can avoid as many as I can avoid, (laughs) let's go. And so I was very adamant about like trying courses and buying things. And, and I probably even got into this place of like, learning and not a lot of doing. doing yes. <laughs> everybody. I feel like that's preaching to everybody right now. If you're right. this podcast and only listening to it and not doing anything I'm telling you to do, hop off this podcast. I don't need your listen. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes. And so that was me. I was buying everything and I made a, my first investment was okay, but it didn't really take me to the next level. Mm-hmm. And I learned so much from that after like spending like, you know, thousands of dollars of, you know, trying to make this work, I realized like I had to be really clear about what I was looking for because I got into a place of, I just needed some help or like, you know, guidance, but I didn't really know what I needed guidance for. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, when it came to entrepreneurship, since we're talking about my situation, I didn't realize that I needed help in certain areas of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I decided that I needed to get really clear first on what I needed help with. Like, where did I want to go? What kind of growth did I want to have? And then I found a coach who specializes in that area. And so that was when things really took off because I was now looking for someone who had had facts, evidence, success stories, and the things that I needed to make me feel like I can trust this person to get me this specific result that I now know I need. I love that. I love that. I think that's really important. And especially if you're listening to this and you're thinking about investing in coaching, I actually don't recommend invest, investing in every coach that you listen to or right. hear or read or whatever. Oh, don't do I don't, it. <laughs> I think it's you gotta be, the, there's a couple of things that I would recommend when thinking about hiring a coach, whether it's for an entrepreneurial adventure, like a business coach, or if you're hiring a traditional career coach, if you're in a nine to five job and mm-hmm. please interject if you have any other thoughts on this. But I think the main thing that you need to figure out is like, is their personality meshing with your personality? Do you think you'll get along? <laughs> That's like a right. very important thing. Yeah. That people sure. don't think about. That's the first thing too. Do they have a methodology that they use that's worked for other people? I think that's the second thing. It's like not just this random coaching. I think there's a lot of people that do coaching, but they don't necessarily have a methodology that works or has proven success. Yeah. So I would really recommend looking into coaches that are investing in their own brands, investing in, in their own businesses, because you know that they're going to invest in you. Yes. And I love how you said like a proven strategy, like do they have an A to Z process or yes. or is it just like, oh, try this and then let's see if it works. Like, yeah. no, you need to invest in someone who can tell you like, this is what we're going to work on. This is exactly what it's going to look like. Mm-hmm. And these are the results you can expect if you do the work. Which traditional coaches would say, that's not how you do it. So we're a mix of coach and strategist. I think both of you. And yes. I, yes. <laughs> we kind of tell people what to do or give them like, here's the, here's the blueprint. So if you're right. a blueprint, you want to work with either one of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you want to know like what you need to do to get you to the next level. It's you and I. <laughs> yes. Yes. Awesome. So tell me like what happens and I would love to kind of ex- explain a little bit about how your process works, which is a perfect mm-hmm. segue. So when somebody comes to you, what's the first thing that you get really clear with them on? I probably just gave away what the first step is, but what do you talk <laughs> to that person about if they're just really confused? So I like to work with people who are like, you've probably been in a similar, similar situation that I've been where you've been at a job and you realize that it's time for a change. And now you're like, I don't, I know I want to change, but I don't know how to get there. Mm-hmm. And so that usually is like the first step where you're like, okay, I think I need some support. And so when it comes to that, it's about first getting clear on what you want to do. Mm-hmm. And so I, I like to give an ex- example of like, most times people come to me with the box of what they want to do. So like, This is kind of like where I want to go, but I really help my clients fill the box, like get really specific. What are the things that you want in that role? What kind of work do you really want to be doing? What kind of company culture are you really looking for? What type of company do you want to be a part of that you're going to feel like you're really making an impact with, you know? And so those are some of the first steps that I help my clients really uncover so that they can be really targeted in their job search approach. Yeah. I think it's kind of likening it to everybody's going towards like, Hey, I'm going to move to this state. Okay. What zip code are you moving to? Like getting like really super specific about what that thing is. Totally agree with you. And so then after that, what happens? What's the next step? So you have five steps to your methodology that you use. Yes. So after you get crystal clear clarity, the next step is changing your story. And so a lot of times you hear people say like, you should make sure your resume is results oriented, but most people don't teach you how to make your resume (laughs) 
with her create a resume with the relevant results. Yes. And so that's what the second step is like changing your story so that you stop focusing on what you do and start focusing on what you want to do next. Sure. And this is like a huge game changer because most people are just like, well, these are all the things I've done. This is all my experience. Please hire me. And they don't see themselves in a way that really matters. They don't talk about themselves in a way that really matters to that next company. And so it's like changing the jargon that you probably use in your current industry and using a, and m- making sure the words you're using matches that next industry or changing some of the accomplishments in your, you know, in your resume to really tailor it to what that next company wants and not just everything you've done. Mm-hmm. So that's really like the second step is like changing not only your mindset, but also how you start to talk about yourself and think about yourself so that people see that you are who they need for that next position. Yeah, I think I don't think enough people talk through mindset. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's something that this, in this podcast, we're going to be talking through a lot more just because I feel like at the end of the day, if I were to look back on the people that were really successful in my recruit, the employer program, which is my signature course, my signature Mm -hmm. program and methodology that I utilize, the people that are successful have a very different mindset than people that are unsuccessful. It's just the reality. And so mindset is a huge piece of the puzzle. So I'm glad that's a part of your program too. Yes. I always say like, you can change up your resume, make it look pretty. You can apply to 50 plus jobs, but if you don't have the right mindset to think you actually deserve the job, if you have self-doubt, if you're second guessing yourself, if you don't even really think you're good enough, then you're always going to sabotage yourself. And so it really starts with mindset and you need both to be able to take your career to where you want it to go. Yeah. I think it really, it's like you can get plastic surgery, but your heart's still going to be the exact same. So if you really don't like yourself, you're not going to like yourself probably after the plastic surgery. Yes. (laughs) Big facts. But there's probably, that's a good analogy. It's true. That's, there's a lot of truth in that. Yep. And then, so after that, after they start changing their story, what's your third step? The third step is copying the culture. And so this is most, mostly talking about how to start getting, again, we're all about being very, very specific. So one, well, second thing is changing your story. So this is like changing your story for the overall role that you want to get next. And then when it comes to copying the culture, you want to start thinking about, you know, when you're already getting clear on what type of culture aligns with you, like what type of company culture would you really feel yourself thriving in? And then when you find those roles, when you're applying for them and putting yourself out there, whether that be in applications or interviews, start making sure that you're talking their language. And so this is a big difference from like copying and pasting keywords because people just kind of like sprinkle keywords and then just hope for the best. But this is really about like making sure that you really resonate with what they are and what their values are, you know, what they're wanting in the role and then showing them that you get them, like showing them that you would fit in, not just like with the skills, but also the personality, the personality traits they want, the work ethic and those other skills that are necessary to show them that you would be able to be successful on their team. Yeah, I'm totally with you there. I think that that the culture piece is such a hot topic these days. And the Mm -hmm. biggest thing that I see with most candidates, and I actually had this in my group program last night, the Recruit the Employer program, we had a conversation and one of the girls said, I'm just so scared. One of the women, excuse me, one of the women said, I'm just (laughs) so scared about going back and going and finding a new position and just like hating that company too. Mm -hmm. And I kind of turned it on her and I said, okay, well, what questions were you asking in those previous interviews? You have to remember that you're interviewing the employer as much as they are interviewing you. So exactly. it's, it's so, so important. The culture piece is important for you to understand so that you can sell yourself in an interview, but it's also important so that you can decide, do I actually want to be here? Exactly. <laughs> it's important to understand, exactly. like, do I have, is this a place that I'm going to call home? It's basically right. your second home, whether you're there for 40 hours a week, 80 hours a week, or 20 hours a week, it's another home base that you have. So if you don't like going into work and you don't like the culture, you're going to leave and come to one of us again. So we really right. don't want that. Although we would right. love to take your money. That's, we just don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's so true. I hear people say that all the, same, all the time. Like, And that keeps a lot of people stagnant because it's like, well, maybe I should just stick with the devil I know and you know, rather than going to the devil I don't know. But it's like, 
No, it, like as much as it sucks to be in a, a terrible work environment, you have you always have a choice. And so it's about really figuring out what kind of culture is best for you. Like, do you like more autonomy or are you more of a collaborative person? Do you like more flexibility or do you really prefer like a more rigid environment because that makes you feel more safe? Like realizing like what you want and then knowing how to make sure that the company is really offering those things is so important so that you don't end up in a place that has the same problem. So I yeah. completely 100% agree with that. And I think everybody has a different opinion on that. So like, for instance, last night in the call, every single one of those women was trying to find a different like size company they wanted to be a part of that had right. different cultures. <laughs> everybody is so different, which I think is such a beautiful testament. Cause I think yes. there's a lot of narrative, at least with me living in New York and being a part of the tech scene there. It, it's just was like, you want to be a part of a startup. And like, if, only if you're part of a startup, are you going to have a good culture? And that's just not it's true. Not true. <laughs> it's so not true. Like sometimes startups are really terrible places to work. And we're right. seeing that come out more and more in the news that mm-hmm. yeah, they have a ping pong table, but their CEO is an idiot. So like, exactly. you have to be really, really diligent because at the end of the day, you're working for someone who is providing you your livelihood. You have right. every single right to interview the crap out of them. Right. And you have every single right to turn the tables. I hate saying turn the tables, but turn the mirror and ask them really hard questions because you have the right to understand whether or not you want to work somewhere because of exactly. paying your bills. <laughs> exactly. And there's so many companies out there, like as much as everyone has different desires or the type of culture they want, there are so many companies that match those different d- desires. And so it's your job to know that you can find a company that meets or aligns with your values and your career goals. Mm -hmm. And just being willing at, like one of the things I teach my clients is, you know, uh, abundance over scarcity, like recognizing that you have an abundant amount of opportunities out there and not settling for something just because you feel like it's your only option as well. Yep. Totally. I love that. So after culture, after you discuss culture with people and they decide kind of, okay, this is really the type of company I want to be a part of. What happens next in your process? Yeah, so then we get into the nitty gritty <laughs> and we talk about, you know, <laughs> how to actually start connecting with real humans. So one of the things that I teach my clients is how to actually bypass the ATS system and bypass the competition by mm-hmm. reaching out to real human beings. And so that means, you know, applying to hiring managers directly via email. And that also means, you know, networking with people and building genuinely mutual, genuine, mutually beneficial relationships with them so that they actually want to help you without you having to beg or ask to get your foot in the door or mm-hmm. awkwardly sending your resume or awkwardly yeah. Talking people on LinkedIn. So, so we're all about doing things in a more authentic and genuine way. And when you follow the steps the right way, you are, by the time you get to step four, you're in a place where you're really clear on what you want. You know how to talk about yourself because you change your story. And then now you're building relationships with people, whether through networking or applying for jobs. And it's with people that you actually want to know and at companies that you actually want to be a part of. Love that. Love that. I think that's such a a core piece to the puzzle. And I think so many people are scared and don't really know how to do that. Um, So giving and equipping those tools, everybody in the Recruit the Employer program, we do the exact same thing where we're really focusing on finding that job. And part of it is like, how do you actually speak to real humans without, I call it non-awkward networking. That's what I call it. Right. Yeah. I call it authentic connection, which is the same thing. Yeah. Non-awkward networking. I'm all about that life. Okay. Once they've connected with real humans, what's your last, your last step is closing the loop. Walk us through what that means. Yeah. So a lot of times people, it's like that, that difference between um, experience and value. So a lot of times when it comes to like, when you finally get into the room and you have these conversations, people kind of tout their experience and that's like your career history, mm-hmm. but people really want to hire people with value. And so like the best companies want people who have the best talent and the best value to add to their teams. And so when it comes to closing the loop, you want to be able to communicate to people how your experience is going to be valuable to them specifically mm-hmm. based on their specific needs. And so rather than just saying like, you know, I have this great experience where I did X, Y, Z on this project and then hoping that they align that with what they need, telling them like, this is exactly the experience I have that I know is going to be invaluable to this specific need that I know that you guys are wanting to solve in this role. And so making sure that people know at every step of the way that everything you've done, even if it's not like completely linear in your like to what their their typical candidate is, making sure that they see how your experience is leveraged for them so that they're not guessing about you or what you can do for them. I love that. I mean you're speaking my love language. 
really like throughout the entire process of when I'm working with clients, we really focus on from the very beginning, even though we don't really get to that step until later as well of actually, how do you tangibly go into an interview and say, like, answer the question, tell me about yourself. But it, it really is about understanding the value that you can bring from the very beginning and starting to practice that and own that. Um, I think so many people, exactly. especially women, um, I, I work predominantly with women um, on a one-on-one basis or group coaching programs. And I just have found that that is the biggest issue for most women is they don't necessarily are, they're not able to communicate. They can't tell themselves, right? Like they don't right. know how to communicate what is the value that they bring because they're waiting for other people to tell them the value that they bring. Right. No. Right. <laughs> right. Stop letting other people be the CEO of your lives. You're the CEO of your own life. And so I love that you have this similar sentiment, which is friends, if you're listening, this is why I brought her on because she is a person who has, we have different methodologies, but they're very similar in a lot of ways and they're aligned. And so if you're ever looking for a career coach that I maybe I'm not a good fit for, I highly, highly recommend Adanala because she's just amazing. She's a sweetheart. She gets results for people. And I just have a question for you. What do you feel like is the yeah, best? Thank you for all that nice oh. kind words. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, you know, I think it's, it's really easy in our industry as entrepreneurs or as coaches. And it can be like, oh, everyone's kind of be- trying to beat out the other person. I just yeah, don't. Really yeah, I agree. I, I really just don't. And so everybody has different things for different people. And so anyways, all that to say, um, question for you. What do you feel like is the biggest thing that you've learned over the course of launching your business, maybe about yourself or just about the job market in general? I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so how do I want to answer that? I think the biggest thing, I'll say the biggest thing I've learned about people. Mm. And, you know, because I've worked with people, you know, who have just started out in their careers. I've worked with people who are directors and VPs. And it's so interesting that one thing always remains the same and it's self-doubt. And I see that in the most like confident people, like people you would think, like, I, like one of my clients right now, she had um, Facebook reached out to her for an interview and you would think that she would be this like, in a sense, like, you know, really confident person, like, well, Facebook wants to reach out to me or wants to connect with me or wants me for the job, Mm -hmm. but she's not, you know? And it's like you, a lot of times you see people maybe on social media or online and you feel like they have it all together. But working in my industry, I've learned so much that a lot of times no one has got together. Mm -hmm. And even the most confident people still have those thoughts of like, am I good enough for this? And that impossible syndrome still is something that has to be, you know, tied up at every step of your career. Like every time you go higher, there's always going to be this voice that tells you like, am I really good enough? Like I've had directors who are directors and work at amazing agencies and companies. And they're like, am I really a director? Because I don't do this one thing that they think they should be doing. <laughs> I literally had a CMO. I have a CMO in my program right now. And she said the exact same thing. She goes, I'm not really a CMO. Like I'm just more of like a director. I'm like, what yeah. is your problem? <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's so crazy. And I think The other thing that I've realized is that a lot of times, even the most confident people, you can start to see their confidence go down because of their current work experiences. So maybe they didn't get that promotion that they knew they deserved, Mm -hmm. or maybe they worked their butt off and no one really recognizes them. Or, you know, maybe they don't really have a nice or kind boss who even cares about them. And so it starts to deteriorate their confidence. And so, you know, it's one of the things that I really am passionate about is helping people realize like, not only can you get the job that you want, but you are good enough and Mm -hmm. you are always good enough. It was just about you realizing that and remembering who you are and giving yourself you know, the real, like sometimes we have to have like real facts of like, this is why I am good enough. And so mm-hmm. I would say that's one thing that I've really learned from people to talk to so many different people in different industries and levels in their career. I relate to that too. Honestly, from a personal, st- from a personal note, I struggle with that from time to time. Like right. generally speaking, I don't, I will say that. Like I probably felt that more in my personal life mm-hmm. over time. And I've talked about that before on the podcast, just about singleness was a really hard thing for me. Mm-hmm. And I felt really insecure in my personal life, my professional life. I felt like super confident in, but there are mm-hmm. times as entrepreneurs that there's like a week where I'm like, why is nobody trying to apply to my amazing program? Like, what's the deal? <laughs> like, what's happening? And then I go into that like little wormhole of where my clients go. And I'm like, nope, 
I can identify right. it now. So I am not immune to that, even though I own my own business. Yeah. And I may seem confident on here. I am. T- I don't know if you relate to that at all, but I know. No, like, 150%. I am like, not I, as for same. Me, <laughs> for me, it happens like whenever I'm trying something new. So like yes. I'm trying something yes. I've never done before. Like right now I'm trying something new in my business. And it's like, oh my gosh, like this is not easy. And whenever you feel like, Whenever you're a beginner, I always just feel stupid, which is like, sure. it's, so, it's it's okay to feel because you actually don't know what you don't know. Yeah. But I can 100% agree that, you know, it happens to every single person. I think that it's important to remember that even CEOs on their first day of work are rookies. Exactly. So it's going to be hard for them. If it's hard for them, it can be hard for me. And I totally, I 100% agree with you. When I'm trying something new, I'm also trying something new in my business this year. And it was a lot of resistance mentally. She has gotten a lot of text messages, friends, from me. <laughs> I've got my anxiety over this, which is so silly. I know it's going to work out. I feel like God had placed that vision on my heart and I'm moving forward in it. However, it still doesn't mean that I'm not scared. And it's right. not like, there is still like those emotions. But I, what I think the difference is, is now I can identify them and process through them a lot quicker than years exactly. past. Exactly. Yes. Yes. And this I think work that's kind of requires key. us to do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're never going to be totally immune to them, but I think it's the identification, the like putting the truth over the lies and like getting in that habit of practicing that of like, this is what I'm believing. This is actually not true. Here's right. the truth. Let me speak that over myself. Okay. Moving on with my day. Exactly. And I think that's required. in when you're trying to make a career change, like a career change is scary, yes. whether so you're just scary. wanting to like leave your company after yes. being there for eight years, or if you're like wanting to make a whole new change into a new industry, it is scary. And so the same steps that you just shared that help you get out of it. I think that that's important for anyone else who feels like, you know, I'm kind of scared about if this is really possible for me. Yeah. I love that. Maybe we'll do an episode on imposter syndrome and I can share some yes. things, some instances where I felt like an imposter. And we all have Same. that days too. <laughs> I think that's another thing to remember is that mm-hmm. all of us, no matter what industry and no matter what level we're in, there everybody has a bad day. This is the other thing I tell my clients and I will shut up about that, but <laughs> <laughs> because I feel like I'm, I've like crushed this, but I tell everybody that like at the end of the day, everybody is allowed to have a bad day because work is actually emotional. It's not transactional. As soon as you start believing the lie that it's transactional, you feel like there's something wrong with you that you can't push through. Like that you're, you're mad at yourself because you feel burnt out at work. You're mad at yourself that you're like so worked up about what your boss said. Like it's emotional. Work is emotional. It just is. (laughs) And once we give ourselves the freedom to see that and to recognize that, we are able to actually dive into that a little bit more. So I think that that's a really important piece as well. Love it. Yes. Agreed. <laughs> awesome. Well, this has been super fun to chat with you. How can people find you if they want to get connected with you? Yes. So if you are interested in learning how I can help you implement the five steps we talked about, you can join or apply to join my Career Redefined program, which you can find at employeeredefined.com. And if you just want to follow me on Instagram, come on, come on over to at the new employees. And I'm also on LinkedIn with my first and last name. I love it. I love it. We're going to have all the information in the show notes. Thank you so much, Adenala, for coming on. And I cannot wait to hear what you guys learned from this. Please send me a message on LinkedIn. Tell me what your biggest takeaway was from this experience and definitely give her a follow. Hey, y'all. Thanks so much for listening to Your Career Story Podcast. I would love, 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 love to get to meet you. And there are a couple of ways that we can connect in between episodes. First and foremost, you know I love my LinkedIn. Second is via Instagram. And third is over on my website. I actually have a special spot just for you full of fun, free resources. So all you have to do is go to www.jennaviviano.com backslash resources. Super simple for a bunch of freebies that will help you boost your career. Hope to see you next week.